Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. In the many programs that function in the fascinating world of astronomical research, one of the most intriguing has to be the Flying Observatory, adapted from a Boeing 747, which can be configured to perform a wide variety of research projects. This requires a very special pilot, and we have one such special pilot with us today. Colonel O'Mara. Thanks, thank you, Cindy. And uh, first of all, we can get rid of the very special pilot because uh, I'm just one of the guys. So, <clears throat> um, as, as you pilots are, are pretty aware of. Uh, first of all, let me tell you just a little bit about myself. Is we okay, Bruce? Okay, a little bit about myself real quickly, and then uh, talk to you a little bit about NASA, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but some of the mission directorates that you may not be familiar with. And we'll talk a little bit about the airplane and the mission. Um, this is just a hero picture. My wife had to have a, a hero picture here, so every, all pilots have hero pictures, so this is just mine. Uh, but, but basically, I was, a, uh, uh, I was born and raised in St. Louis area, uh, learned to fly when I was in high school. In fact, I'll do that. Learned to fly in high school, as, as many of you did, I'm sure. And then uh, went to uh, the Air Force Reserves, flew in the reserve for 22 years. It's got Air Force Base to the C-9 Nightingale, which was a flying hospital. Uh, great, great mission in the Air Force. We flew eight stops a day and picked up wounded all around the world and uh, took them to hospitals around the world. So my job was to save people when I was in the Air Force. Um, got a hire with United in 1985, retired from them in, in uh, 2018 to age 65, as you are aware of. You have to quit at age 65. Uh, but I flew with NASA for about three years while I was at United. So that's kind of a little bit about my background here. Um, Let's see, is this, there we go. So let's talk a little bit about NASA, first of all, and then we'll, then we'll kind of go into specifics. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware what NASA does. Everybody knows the astronauts, and uh, they're the famous people, and, and uh, the rest of us are uh, research pilots, and we don't have the notoriety that the astronauts do. But NASA actually has five mission directorates, and I'm sure you're familiar with them, but uh, two of them are aeronautics and science. And that's the ones that really don't, we don't get the, the, the press coverage that the astronauts do. They're the, they're the, the famous guys in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in, in NASA. Um, what SOFIA does is, SOFIA is just one of the missions that in the aeronautics and science directorate that, uh, that NASA held. Um, and you might say, well, what, you know, what is SOFIA? SOFIA stands for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And what it does, it's just an airborne observatory, the only one in the world. There was one of these airplanes in the whole world. That's it. We were it. Um, and people said, well, why do we want an airborne observatory that ran about a million dollars a night to operate the airplane? Uh, so th with the James Webb Space Telescope, it's, uh, it's done such a wonderful job that it has basically put Sophia out of business. I don't know if you followed Sophia at all, but uh, Sophia retired in... Uh, October, I think it was October and November of 2022 when uh, it flew to the Pima Air Museum uh, where, where it will sit, I guess, for the rest of its life. And in fact, my wife and I were just out there the other day to, to see it and it's out in the, uh, in the, in the, the hot sun and going to lose all the, the nice paint and the polish that the, the, the mechanics put in on it for years. But if you get a chance to go see it, it's, it's well worth the drive. In fact, just the museum is well worth the drive. But the, the reason that SOFIA existed was there are plenty of uh, ground observatories around the world, as, uh, as uh, pictured here. But you, know, you can imagine uh, if, if anything uh, gets between the ground observatory and the celestial body that they're trying to observe, such as clouds, you know, you just, uh, all of a sudden, the, the, uh, the astronomers who have booked that, uh, that observatory, they may lose all of their observing time. So in the mid-60s, NASA came up with an idea to, pr to produce a, a flying observatory. Started at about 65, I think it was. They had a little, uh, a little Lear 25 with a little 12-inch uh, telescope. They got a uh, Convern 990 that they operated for a while. Uh, the latest one was the Kuiper C-141A, and some gentleman up here just showed me a picture that he had. It slow up at NASA Ames. That uh, went out of business like 74 time frame, I think. But the... Astronomers really wanted to get a, a, an airplane with a large diameter 
uh, telescope. Well, what's the biggest airplane out there was the 747. So when it flew back, back in 1969, astronomers started thinking, well, let's just modify this 747. Well, that didn't happen until later. We'll, we'll talk about that. But that's the reason that Sophia exists, is because you get uh, obscurations, you get rain, you get all sorts of things that obscure the, uh, the astronomers, their ability to uh, observe the, the uh, atmosphere. Part of uh, what NASA does is, and it's again not very widely publicized, is we have an aeronautics mission directorate. Um, and maybe before I could talk about that, let's talk about a little bit about the, the type of pilots that fly for, um, for NASA. I'm not one of the special pilots, but thank you very much for that. But uh, the, the other guys that I flew with really are. Um, the NASA has, uh, in addition to the astronauts, which we all know about, they've got research test pilots which is, I understand it, have to be a TPS graduate, a test pilot school graduate. They do the, they fly the pointy airplanes. Uh, they do a lot of the flight tests, and I'll show you some pictures here in just a little bit. Uh, I was what's called a research pilot. I was specifically a science research pilot. Uh, we we, we uh, spe specialized in astrophysics. Uh, but also the, uh, uh, NASA has a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of missions that do uh, research just in our own atmosphere. Um, I'll show you a picture here. This is a, a DC-8 that, uh, that uh, flies, in fact, it still flies. They're uh, actually getting rid of this airplane and going to a 777, as I understand it, pretty soon. But this airplane still flies, and it does a lot of atmospheric research. It will go up and it'll sample the, 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 any pollution in the air. It will fly up and down the coast of California. It will look at fault lines and how they move. Uh, it flies all around the world, actually. Um, one of the missions that I, I would love to have, have flown this airplane, but the, uh, uh, the, the, I did not have any DC-8 times. I flew, I flew 747s a lot, so I wound up uh, getting assigned to that airplane as opposed to the, the DC-8. But the DC-8, what it did was it was part of the aeronautics mission, science mission. It would fly around the world, and it would observe, like I said, ground faults, uh, uh, the, uh, the chemical uh, pollution in the air. Um, one of the missions that it, uh, here's a good picture of one of the missions of uh, Dave and the guys uh, flying over Antarctica. And like I said, I would love to have flown this mission because it was much more dynamic than what we did at Sophia. The thing would go down to several hundred feet above the ice cap and fly 500 feet at several hundred knots uh, above the ice cap. You imagine how much fun that would be, flying over Ant Antarctica. Uh, it might, at the same mission, the scientists may want to sample the, you know, pollutants in the air above Antarctica. So they might fly 500 feet and all of a sudden zoom up to 35,000 feet or something and, uh, uh, and take air samples and then fly, just fly around the world, do that very same thing. One of the missions I heard about that I wasn't on, but I, I did hear about, uh, was they were over uh, flying out of uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, I believe, at the time, uh, where we used to take our 747 to, and they were actually... Um, out of the South Pacific near Fiji, what I've heard, and I hope I'm telling this accurately, but uh, the, uh, the, the pilot who related this to me said they were actually over the South Pacific, up near Fiji, at night, they hear a, an airplane, uh, or uh, hear a voice on guard, all NASA military pilots are required to monitor 121.5 guard, and they hear a voice says, um, aircraft, identify yourselves, this an, uh, aircraft uh, approaching a US naval warship, identify yourselves or you'll be shot down. Well, that got their attention. So the guys in the, in the DC-8 uh, said, well, this is NASA. We're an we're a atmospheric research aircraft, and we're just on an atmospheric research mission. Well, the guy on the other side of the, 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 other side of the 1215 says, I don't know what NASA is. Just identify yourselves or you'll be shot down. Well, and then Dave and the guys said, well, you're Navy. We're NASA. We're on the same team, so don't shoot at us. So they finally, I guess, after several attempts to tell them not to, be, to, to shoot at them, they wound up, uh, an, another older sounding voice came on the radio and said, okay, NASA, we're Navy, you're clear to, pr to proceed. But I guess apparently this young seaman didn't know what NASA was. So <laughs> I, 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 I can't imagine that, but uh, you know, and I hope this, tr this story is as accurate as I've heard, but uh, that's, that's what I remember hearing. So again, this is, this is kind of the things what, uh, what NASA does. Another thing, we have a, a, a C-20, a Gulfstream 3, a, a Palmdale also, and it does the same thing. It uh, does a lot of atmospheric research. Uh, what we did, though, 
uh, was that's we were strictly astrophysics. So one of the things that the uh, the flight test the, the research test pilots do is they do the flight test on the various uh, new aircraft, the X planes. I think a couple of months ago, a couple of friends of mine, uh, Nils and Clue, were here talking about the X-59 just a few months ago. Uh, I'm sure you heard about that, the X-59 Quest and the, the quiet supersonic technology aircraft. Uh, there's also coming up the, the latest X plane I've heard about is the new X-66A. I don't know if you heard about that. It's a uh, uh, an MD-90 fuselage with a, a truss braced wing. So the flight test pilots are all research, uh, they're uh, test pilot school graduates, and they do the flight test research. We do just science. So that's a little bit about NASA and what, uh, what the pilots, various pilots are. Let's talk a little bit about the aircraft. So originally, this airplane 536, Unifor, or 536 Papa Alpha was uh, sold to Pan Am. Now, a long time ago, Juan Tripp, when he ran Pan Am, they used to have a mission that they, or trip, uh, that they ran from uh, New York to Tokyo. The 747-100s, 200s at the time, just really didn't quite have the fuel to make it there with much reserve. So Juan Tripp went to Pan Am and said, you know, we need an airplane that we can get in New York to Tokyo and have enough gas to feel comfortable. And uh, Boeing said, well, we can take care of that. So they designed the 747 SP, or Special Performance Model. There are only 45 of them built. It's a fairly rare airplane. Um, NASA, uh, Pan Am originally had this airplane labeled as Clipper Lindbergh. It first flew in uh, April of 77. And then in May of 77, May 20th to be exact, uh, what is May 20th of, of uh, May 20th of 77? Does that remind you of any any dates? May 20th of 77, 50 years to the day that Charles Lindbergh flew the Atlantic. So this airplane was Clipper Lindbergh, and 50 years to the day that uh, Charles uh, Lindbergh flew the Atlantic, his wife was still uh, still alive at the time, and Marl Lindbergh was still alive. So she came out and and christened Clipper Lindbergh in uh, May of uh, 1977. In fact. Uh, Charles Lindbergh's grandson, Eric Lindbergh, just uh, christened the airplane in uh, May of 2007 for the 80th anniversary of, uh, of his grandfather's, uh, grandfather's flight. In fact, the, I, I belong to a group back in St. Louis area where I, where I live kind of full time. Uh, we just got uh, Char Eric Lindbergh's airplane that flew the Atlantic to recreate the, the flight. Uh, he donated that airplane to the, the operation that I fly for, for a, a dollar. And so we now fly Eric Lindbergh's airplane that, uh, that flew across the Atlantic. But so the, the uh, 747 uh, SP, they're only getting 45 of them built. As far as I know, uh, NASA was the only one that operated as, well, I know it's the only, only observatory. But as far as I know, there's only about two or three flying. Uh, there's uh, Sheldon Adelson in uh, Las Vegas had two. One was damaged, I heard. Now he still has one, as far as I know, that uh, picks up high rollers and flies them around the world. It brings them back to Vegas for his, uh, uh, his gambling casinos. Uh, there's one in, um, there's a, 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 a church in Ohio, I want to say. I know Iran Air, I used to see them all the time in, uh, in Beijing when I'd fly out there for United. Iran Air had a couple of them, but as far as I know, the only one that flies anymore is maybe Sheldon Adelson's and uh, um, the, the one in, uh, in Ohio. So all, all 45, as far as I know, are grounded, ours being one of the last. So the, the airplane, uh, when, when uh, Pan Am had it, uh, they flew it from, uh, from 77 until about 1986. Pan Am in, uh, in, Jan in February of 1986 bought uh, Pan Am's Pacific Division and they bought, uh, one of the airplanes that came over was, uh, was 536 UA. Uh, United designated it as 145 UA. In fact, I got to fly the airplane uh, when United had it. In fact, in fact a, a quick story was when I hired on with NASA, they, uh, uh, there was all the NASA pilots sitting on one side of the desk and I'm on the other side of the desk being interviewed. They said, well, we see you've got you know, years and years and years of teaching on the 747 and thousands of hours, but have you flown an SP because there's not many around? And I said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, 145 UA, which is your airplane now, I flew that airplane 10 years before any of you guys flew it. So I said, okay, they said, okay, you're hired then. So I, I got the job just because I had flown it 10 years before the NASA guys flew it. But the, uh, 
when, when uh, United bought the airplane in 86, uh, they only flew it for about nine years. They retired it actually December of 95, and then uh, NASA bought it then for $13 million. Uh, so they took it to, if I can get a picture here, they took it actually out to Waco, Texas in 2000. Uh, it started, uh, in fact, they first uh, cut first metal on it in March of 2000, and it took them seven years of working on it to get the thing to fly. This is kind of what it looked like in, uh, in assembly in, uh, uh, in, in Waco. They had to do a lot of modifications. Uh, they, they had to get a, a, cut a, a great big uh, upper rigid door in the fuselage. In fact, I don't know if you can see it very well, but just for the uh, stairs here, uh, you can see the upper rigid door being cut. Um, the upper rigid door was the door that is inside the airplane that slid into the top of the airplane exactly like, uh, oops, exactly like uh, your garage door. It was an 18 by 23 foot door that you could fly, you could drive two semis through it. And uh, the thing would, uh, we would open the door in flight. We had a big 100 inch, 100 inch ca uh, cascade nace in the telescope and would uh, make the observations. So you see the, I'll show you some pictures of the uh, upper rigid door. But so anyway, the thing was in modification for seven years. And it finally flew in, uh, let's see if I can get it here. Finally flew uh, April 26th of 07. Uh, NASA astronaut uh, uh, Gordon Fullerton and the guy named Bill Brockett and Larry uh, LaRose flew the airplane for the first time after seven years. And uh, it was ready to go, so NASA brought it back to, uh, to Dryden. Dryden now, as you know, is called the, uh, the uh, uh, Armstrong Flight Research Center, but uh, at the time that this was brought back, it was still named after Hugh Dryden, uh, which was a former NASA administrator. Now, again, it's, it's the Armstrong Flight Research Center, who I used to fly for. Uh, that, was, that was my, my home base. So anyway, the airplane came back uh, in 2007, and it uh, came back to Edwards Air Force Base. And I don't know have you been up, if you've been up to Edwards Air Force Base, the, the NASA ramp is pretty small. It's not very big. The, the pointy airplanes, the F-15, uh, uh, the F-18 that they fly, the King Airs, the T-34s they fly up there, the ramp is plenty big for them. But the airplane was just too big for the ramp at uh, Palmdale, or at uh, Edwards, so they took it to Palmdale. I'll show you some, some pictures here. So there's the, there's the airplane arriving at uh, Edwards Air Force Base and on the ramp at uh, the Dryden Flight Research Center. And uh, everybody, all the, the 38, uh, the F-18s, I'm sorry, that, uh, that arrived with it. And here it's coming back to uh, Palmdale, where we continue to operate. Um, the, uh, the airplanes, all the big airplanes, the DC-8, the 747, the ER-2s, which is the NASA version of the U-2, basically, and our, and our Gulfstream 3 operator out of the big hangar, which you'll see here just a little bit uh, at Palmdale. Here's an example of what the, uh, the, the door op looks like. Um, the airplane, I, I never flew the airplane during the day. I guess it could fly during the day because I've seen pictures, but I didn't know it could fly during the day. I never flew it during the day. We always flew it at night. Uh, but one thing that the, the telescope couldn't, uh, it, it just didn't tolerate sunlight on the mirror itself. So when the, uh, when the guys tested it, they had to test the, the door open and see if see about how much uh, damage would happen to the the mirror in fact when i was at united or at nasa we used to have procedures that if you landed during the day which we never did but if if for some reason the mission extended and you had to go someplace and land during the day and the door couldn't be closed uh, we had procedures that you could only taxi with the, the sun opposite the side of the open door because it would damage the mirror. So we had to make sure we, whenever we taxied to someplace, the sun was always pointing on the right side of the airplane because the sun, if it was on the left side, would damage the airplane. But they had to test to make sure that the airplane could fly with the door open. So this is pictures of it flying with it open. And in, tw in 2010, I, I'm not sure if Troy or some of the other guys uh, did this test. They actually were able to land the airplane with the door open to make sure that uh, they could still fly with the door open. Um, the, the airplane, still talking a little bit about the airplane. The airplane was basically, uh, you, you'll see, the, I've, I've had people ask in some of these talks before, well, how, could, how did you fly? Was it unpressurized? Well, the back part of the airplane was. Where the telescope existed, the, uh, that part of the airplane was unpressurized. So between the telescope 
and the crew cabin, which was the rest of us, there's a big 29 inch thick uh, mid cabin pressure bulkhead. And I'm sure you know, you're all aeronautical people, so you're familiar with pressurization systems. But in, the, in all pressurized airplanes, there's a forward cabin pressure bulkhead and an aft pressure bulkhead. All the, all the, the pressurized air is kept in there so we can fly, so we can fly at our shirt sleeves and so we can breathe. Uh, but the, uh, uh, because the door was going to be open in flight, so they could make the observations, the, uh, there was a big uh, mid cabin, 29 inch thick mid cabin pressure bulkhead just forward of the, the door. And that, I you can see that in the picture. Uh, it's kind of a blue ring with the, uh, the uh, big uh, uh, pressure bulkhead. In fact, the, the, the pressure, the, the bulkhead was so strong that it was, uh, uh, when we pressurized the airplane 8.8 .8 PSID, which was, uh, we'd typically fly at that, at the altitudes we flew at, it would put a million pounds of axial pressure against that, that pressure bulkhead. Yeah, so you can imagine a million pounds basically being pushed on, on the screen here, basically. That's, that's what it was. So it was a very, 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 very well built uh, uh, piece of equipment. The, uh, typically what happened was uh, uh, on a mission, we'd have the, all the science crew would be downstairs. The flight crew obviously is upstairs flying the airplane. But the science crew shows some pictures here. Uh, the science crew would be forward with a lot of the uh, electronic equipment that they used to make the observations. Um, the, the open telescope uh, bay was behind that big, big pre mid cabin pressure bulkhead that you can see uh, the, the gray area. And there's a picture of the, the door open. Again, that's a big 18 by 23 foot upper rigid door would slide up at the top of the fuselage. So about 90% of the fuselage was actually open as we're flying in flight. Uh, that give an idea of the uh, uh, of how the engineers were able to design to design the aircraft so that it would withstand those loads, and the thing was amazing to me is uh, the first time I flew it, uh, in, uh, when I got hired by NASA, uh, we, at NASA the, the way the way I used to operate. In fact, I don't know if they still do, but the way it operated back then when I was uh, when I joined, you got one flight in the right seat, and that was your getting get familiar with the airplane. Your next flight. You happen to the left seat, they said, okay, not your check ride. So you want to know I got one chance to learn the mission, and then the very next night, they, have, they put you in the left seat, ran the mission, and that was your check ride. But when I flew the airplane, I thought, okay, this is going to really, when the door opens, it's going to really be, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to vibrate, it's going to buff it, it's going to be noisy. And the, uh, the first night we did it, um, they opened the door, and I didn't hear a thing. So the engineers, all of you engineers out here who designed this thing, uh, it's just, just an amazing engineering, engineering job. Uh, the mission crew director and the engineer would open the door, and I was thinking, okay, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start vibrating here any minute now. And they said, three, two, one, doors open, nothing. So it's a uh, very, very well-designed piece of equipment. This is a little bit about uh, the, a picture of some of the, uh, the crew. Typically, uh, we had a pilot co-pilot, and we were all qualified left seat and right seat. So one night you'd fly left seat, the next night you'd fly right seat. It didn't really matter where you, where you flew. Uh, and we had an engineer up top. We fly 10-hour missions. It's just the three of us, so it was a very, very tiring night. Um, and then in, the, in, the, in the, the lower part of the airplane, we would have uh, a mission crew director or sometimes two. We'd have the scientists who were basically uh, who was our customer, we would then fly these scientists to the various observation points that they needed. And we had uh, technicians who operated the telescopes and were safety technicians who would fix the airplane in flight if need be. If need be. But this is just some of the pictures of the electronic stations that they, uh, that they uh, uh, gathered at uh, during, the, uh, during the flight. Here's a picture of the telescope itself. The, uh, the telescope had uh, was, was, was a kind of a, uh, uh, the telescope itself was, was a fixed, well, I shouldn't say fixed, it was, uh, what's the best way to say it? The telescope itself um, was, was just always the same, but the various, uh, there were various instruments that could be attached to the telescope itself. Uh, the scientists, when they came up with the mission that they wanted to observe this or that, they would uh, develop a, a, a piece of equipment that could be attached to the telescope, and the, uh, the scientists would then make their observations with that. And that's just kind of an idea of uh, what the telescope with the, uh, one of the receivers looks like. More of the telescope. This is kind of an interesting story. The, uh, the hangar we used to keep it up, uh, keep it at in uh, Palmdale was just 
the, the biggest hangar I had ever seen. We used to keep our, our 747, as you see, the DC-8, the ER-2s that had a big 108-foot wingspan or whatever it was, the, D, the uh, Gulfstream 3. So just a huge hangar. Um, I had heard stories when I was flying uh, for NASA that, that uh, the, the movie um, Pirates of the Caribbean, remember that movie back in the long time ago, had used this hangar uh, for its, its set. And I just talked to uh, a, an architect who actually helped design this building Wednesday night. And he said, that's a true story. They cleared out all the, all the airplanes, and I don't know how long it took them to shoot, but basically they flooded the hangar, and the, uh, uh, they shot the movie, part, parts of the movie, Pirates of the Caribbean, in our hangar. That's, that's how big the thing is. Um, here's a little bit about the, about the mission now. We talked a little bit about the airplane, a little bit about the mission. Typically, uh, the, the crew would get together about two hours and 15 minutes prior to a mission on one side of the hangar. The scientists would get together about an hour and 45 uh, prior to the mission on the other side of the hangar. We, uh, the, the flight crew, we would talk about the mission, where we're going to go, the weather, the mechanical condition of the airplane, things like that. And then we'd go over and listen to the, the scientists who were going to, uh, who we were flying for, basically, our customers, basically. And, and the interesting thing about flying with the, uh, the astrophysicists, and they're all extremely intelligent guys. All of them were PhD pluses, basically. Uh, a lot smarter than the rest of us pilots and, and engineers. But the, uh, uh, the scientists would, would talk about the mission that they're going to try to uh, accomplish that night. And I just remember many, many times listening to these scientific uh, 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 the description of what they're going to do and looking at the other guy going, what did he just say? Is he speaking English? Because I don't understand anything that he's talking about here. But, but it was fascinating because then they would come to the cockpit and, you know, when, when they were on, on break, and they would look around the cockpit and say, how do you guys understand all this stuff? I'd say, well, it's, you know, it's just what we're trained to do. Just as they said, we're trained to do astrophysics, you're trained to fly airplanes. So it's, we all just do what we do best, I guess. But it was just fascinating to, to listen to, to the, the two sides of, of the mission. Typically, what a mission would be would, because we were, the airplane was, was, was so heavy on takeoff, we would typically fly pretty much gross weight every night. Uh, the thing uh, weighed 699,000 pounds taxi out, 696,000 pounds on takeoff, and would carry typically around 320,000, 330,000 uh, 330, pounds of fuel, fly 10 hours, land with about... Uh, burn about 220,000 gallons of fuel, of pounds of fuel each night. So the airplane was so heavy that when we flew, we had to, do, uh, had to step up each, time, each, uh, each hour or so. So typically we'd take off and wind up uh, being heavy, so heavy that we could only get up to the mid-30s, 36, 37,000 feet, something like that. Um, part of the reason for the, the flying observatory is we want to get above as much of the water vapor as you can. That's the, the whole point of uh, the, uh, the infrared mission that we were flying. So to do that, we had to get as high as we could. So the scientists were always asking us, okay, when can you guys climb? Well, we, it, all, it was all based on what we weighed. So we'd take off at 696,000 pounds. We could only get to 36, 37,000 feet. We had to burn off another hours or few worth of fuel or more and go up the next thousand feet and so on and so on. We'd wind up typically at the end of a flight Oh, typically 43,000. It could get to 45,000, and sometimes we did that, but typically we'd wind up at 43,000 feet at the end of a mission. So this is kind of the, just showing the, the step climbs that we used to do. And the reason for that, again, was because we, we did, needed to get above, above all of the, the water vapor. And, and we were usually pretty successful. We can get above 97, 98% of the water vapor so that the telescope can do its job. The telescope itself was a, a big 100-inch Cassegrain Naismith, a huge, huge telescope, biggest one that's ever been on an, on an airplane. And uh, again, it was, uh, it, it was an infrared, it was modified, or it was um, optimized for infrared. It could see visible light, but it was really optimized for infrared. That's why we needed to get above the water vapor, which blocked the infrared light. So typically, this is the, kind of the, a flight profile. And this is kind of an idea of a, a flight plan. Uh, the way it worked is um, the, the scientists around the world who needed to study some celestial event, some celestial body, 
would come to NASA, <clears throat> excuse me, and the University Space Research Association, and they'd say, we want to study this. And NASA and the USRA would say, well, that's been done before. We're not going to spend a million dollars a mission, was what roughly it cost. We're not going to spend a million dollars a night to do this. So that didn't happen. Some, but somebody who, who had a mission uh, that uh, NASA deemed worthy to, to fly, they would then present their flight plan, what, what they needed to see at certain times and, and certain uh, points in space to our navigators who were typically, I think most of them, I think maybe all of them were uh, military navigators and they would then take the, the points that the scientists needed to be at. So the scientists needed to see a certain body at a certain time at a certain place. The navigator's job was to design a flight plan so that all of the points in space could be met on a typical 10 hour flight. And then we would, as the pilots, then we would have to make sure the airplane got to these, these points. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the, the magic behind some of this stuff. But this is, a, this is kind of a typical flight plan. We take off out of Palmdale, always fly out of Palmdale, uh, except in our summer, uh, we would go down to Christchurch, New Zealand, and operate out of the Air Force's uh, Antarctic Flight Research Center down there. Um, and people would say, well, why do you have spent all that time going down there? Well, because if you're trying to make observations of the southern universe, if you're in the northern hemisphere, you can't see because the Earth's in the way. So basically, in, this, in our summer, their winter, we would fly the airplane down to Christchurch, New Zealand. We would base out of there for three months and make observations of the southern universe. We'd fly over... Antarctica, we'd fly out to Australia, we'd fly the, the South Pacific Islands. Uh, I, I just love the mission. I don't know if you've been down to, to New Zealand, but it's a, it's a great place. They love us. Uh, every time we'd bring Sophia down, the whole town would, would turn out. Uh, they would uh, throw get-togethers for us uh, all the time. Uh, they'd have, we'd taxi in, they'd have their water cannons. You've, sh you've seen those before. Well, the first time, another quick story. First time I, I flew the airplane down there, uh, we landed, and I'd never been to Christchurch, so we're kind of watching the taxi routes and making sure we go to the right place. Uh, and uh, so we're taxiing on this little narrow taxiway to the Antarctic Research Center. Again, I've never been there, so we're watching our taxi charts pretty closely. And all of a sudden, the, the fire trucks start shooting the water cannon, which is great, except it was right above the windshield. All of a sudden, I couldn't see a thing. I thought, oh my God, if I run this airplane off into the mud with everybody watching, I am going to be in big trouble. So we were scrambling, trying to find, I'm trying to taxi with the tiller, and we're scrambling trying to find the, the windshield wipers. I'm going to yell at the co-pilot, get the, get the windshield wipers on. I, I literally couldn't see anything. And it's like trying to drive your car when you can't see forward at all, except I've got a $1 billion airplane that I'm responsible for. And everybody's watching, that's the worst part. So I really tried to, uh, tried to make sure that we didn't run in the mud. But a typical flight might be, uh, you know, to show, this one shows going out of Palmdale up to like Washington State and all the way across the, the, the northern uh, United States and then down over the eastern United States and then the southern states landing back in, uh, in Palmdale. I've flown flights that have gone from Palmdale to basically the North Pole and back from Palmdale out to Hawaii and down to New Mexico and back. So we fly typically, typically a, a, less, a mission was about 10 hours, about 4,000 miles. We take off out of Palmdale, land at Palmdale, and for those of you who are pilots who are interested in getting cross-country time, you couldn't log cross-country time. We take off and land at the same airport, so that's not considered cross-country flight. Even though you've flown 4,000 miles and 10 hours, you took off and landed at the same airport. So for those of you interested in logging cross-country time, you couldn't even log cross-country time. But this was kind of, uh, this was a typical mission uh, that would fly in the United States. Um, in flight, you'd see the, you can see pictures of the stations for the, 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 uh, the crew directors, uh, the mission director, uh, the telescope operators would be down in the, in the lower part of the airplane. And uh, they would make their observations basically that they needed. The things we used to do, uh, some of the, the, the mission things, uh, we would study like the, the chemical composition of the, of the universe. Um, 
We'd study the birth and death of stars. We'd study uh, the, uh, uh, just all sorts of, uh, uh, like the, the Milky Way, things like that. Uh, a couple of the, uh, the interesting things that uh, I, I, we'll talk about the, uh, the missions here. I just saw, I don't know if you saw the Planetary Science Journal uh, Thursday. I don't, if you, I don't know if you get that magazine or read the, read the magazine, but uh, Sophia back in 2022, before it, uh, it was grounded, uh, they, they discovered uh, water on two asteroids. That was just reported in the uh, pl uh, journal Planetary Sciences uh, Thursday, I think it was. The neat thing about uh, the, the missions that we used to do at, uh, at Sophia was it was just, again, cutting edge science, cutting edge uh, information. The, the information that the scientists would get would be brought back to Earth that day, that morning. So we'd land, at, we'd take off after dark, land before, uh, before daylight, and already the scientists are at work gathering the data, analyzing the data, but you and I typically didn't know about it for years. Typically it would take, they would have to publish it, they have to peer review it, they would argue about it. Uh, so typically all the information that they got uh, might take a couple of years before we all hear, hear, hear about it. And uh, I just, just look at the Journal of uh, Planetary Sciences Thursday and uh, they uh, didn't, didn't realize this, but uh, one of the missions they discovered water on two asteroids, uh, Malus, Mal Mal I can't remember the names of them all of a sudden, but uh, uh, so that's the first time that's ever been done. Uh, they also, Sophia, in 20, uh, 2019, or 2019 or 2020, I think it was, discovered water on the moon. So we were the first ones to do that. So a lot of the science that we did, you might, uh, was very, uh, very cutting edge. This is a picture of what infrared looks like. Uh, on the left, if you looked at Jupiter, you and I would see this picture on the left. What NASA, what the Sophia would see would be the picture on the right. It saw, it saw visible light that was really optimized for infrared. An example might be also, you'd look at uh, Orion, the hunter. Uh, if you look at what we would, would you would see Orion, uh, uh, it would look like uh, the, the, the picture on the left. But what uh, Sophia would see would be this. It would just see all the bright stars. It would see the, it would see the, the uh, that's what Orion would look like uh, from what uh, NASA would see, or Sophia would see. Uh, initially, yeah, the flight, the, the science flight started in 2010, and they just, I don't know if you've seen that they just retired the airplane in December of 2022. Uh, Jim Les, uh, a couple of friends of mine, the Jim and, and uh, Liz Ruth and uh, Tim Sandon flew the airplane to the uh, Pima Air Museum where it sits right now. Um, let me show you this one here. This is kind of fascinating. This mission actually occurred in 2015. Um, I, I love, to, love to talk about this mission because when you, if you really stop and think about this, the science, the navigation, the engineering behind this mission to me is just, it's just mind blowing actually. We had a, a mission um, that Ace and Gucci and, and some of the other guys flew on uh, in uh, 2015 while they were down at uh, Christchurch. They wanted to look at the, they wanted to study the atmosphere of Pluto. Well, how do you do that? So they had a, a, a celestial body, and I can't remember the name of the celestial body, who was on the far side of Pluto, shining its light, a, a star, shining its light through the atmosphere of Pluto, and then uh, Sophia had to be on the receiving end. So basically, the, it was an occultation or eclipse, we call them, but uh, so the, uh, the navigators had to design a mission to fly 4,000 miles, 10 hours, which is what we typically did, but they had to be at a particular point in space to observe this occultation. They only had two and a half seconds of observing time. So we had to fly a, had to fly, you know, I mean, I, I flew for United Airlines. And if we told the people we'd get there on Tuesday, and we got there on Tuesday, we felt pretty good. You know, I mean, okay, I, I promised you Tuesday, and we got you there Tuesday, all right, I feel pretty good about that. You know, but at, at NASA, the, uh, the tolerances were much closer. We actually had to get to our points in space, usually within one or two minutes of our assigned time. This particular mission, uh, Ace and, and Gucci and the guys had to get uh, the airplane to that particular point in space, again, after having flown 10 hours, they had to go all around the South Pacific and then get back to a particular point and it only had a two and a half second window to make the observation. 
as the points flew past each other, as the, or the, uh, the celestial bodies flew past each other, they had two and a half seconds. If they missed it, it would have been done. These, these scientists who had been counting on this, this observation for years, it just would be done. You know, and there were times that that happened. There were times that, unfortunately, um, the, the airplane would break. I've only been on one, I think only one mission, fortunately, uh, in, in the years I flew for NASA, that uh, the airplane would break. And unfortunately, all the observations that the scientists were planning on that night, they didn't exist. So they'd say, well, okay, we'll just fly tomorrow night. Well, you can't just fly tomorrow night because all the scientists from that night are planning on flying that night. So the timing, the, um, all this was extremely critical. I get much, much more, much tighter tolerances than I ever, ever flew at the airline. So this, I always think, is a, a very fascinating mission. This is a picture of what the, uh, the atmosphere of Pluto looks like. So there's a, there's a star behind Pluto. It shines past the planet. The, the planet Pluto, which I think there's still some discussion of whether Pluto's a planet anymore. When we were kids, there were planets. Now they say it's not. I, I still call it a planet. But, but anyway, uh, so here's, the, here's what the atmosphere of Pluto looks like as seen from Sophia, having been sh shown through a, 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 a star basically on the other side of Pluto, on occultation. And this was the, uh, the flight, plan, uh, the flight path, path that the guys had to fly. They took off out of Palmdale, again flew 10 hours, 4,000 miles roughly, and had to be at that particular point in space. They had two seconds, two and a half seconds. Again, at the, at the airline, I didn't worry nearly about seconds. I was worried about, did I get there the right day? Um, so this is, this is where we'd fly out of, out of New Zealand. Uh, this was a, uh, kind of a typical, a typical flight where we would just fly all around the South Pacific. We kind of talked a little bit about that. Um, when the airplane was down for maintenance, one of our issues, we, we had, uh, the airplane had JT90-7J engines on them, and the engines, we were, when we were flying the airplane, we were always, you know, again, you're all, most of your aeronautical people, uh, you know about limits or, or for engines and airplanes, things like that. When we typically flew, we were right at the limit of where we were running the engines. Uh, we, might, uh, we might be flying at such an altitude where we might have 10 or 15 knots difference between low speed buffet and high speed buffet. Corner, coffin corner, I'm sure you've heard that term. Well, we were in coffin corner, close to it at least, pretty much the whole flight. Uh, we were always running the, the, the J engines uh, pretty much against the EGT and the, uh, the speed limits pretty much the whole flight. So they were, they were run pretty hard. But again, the mechanics were just fantastic about keeping, keeping them all in flight, uh, all, all operational. Um, but for overhaul, uh, we, we didn't have the capability here in the States, so we would take the airplane to, to Stuttgart and, uh, and operate the, uh, do our heavy maintenance there. Here's a picture of what the airplane looked like uh, before uh, NASA converted it and then afterwards. When I flew it, it looked like the picture on the upper, on the upper, uh, upper picture here, the old analog gauges. It was, I mean, I loved the airplane. It was a little hot rod. It was a, it was a great airplane to fly. I flew the 747-400. I taught on the airplane for 12 or 13 years, I guess, 7,000 hours or 8,000 hours, whatever it was. Uh, and I loved the airplane. But the, the 400, was, uh, the, the SP is a little hot rod, like driving a little Corvette maybe as opposed to a, a sedan. So. Uh, when NASA uh, got the airplane, they, they needed a much tighter tolerances, as we just talked about earlier. So when they modified the airplane, they put all electronic flight instruments in it, which is the picture that you see below. One of the things we did uh, on, on, on all our missions, we would get some we had guest people. We'd have uh, teachers in space. We'd have uh, uh, teachers would, would wind up, um, they would wind up uh, uh, interviewing to get uh, taken on our missions. And we also have some celebrities. Uh, see a picture here of, you've all heard of Fred Hayes. Here's a picture of uh, Fred Hayes when he was a young astronaut. And then uh, we took him on a flight. And uh, so that's Fred up in the, up in the cockpit. Um, a couple of the other things we did was, uh, uh, in addition to our science, we also took a lot of celebrities in flight. I wish we didn't have a, I should have put a name on this, but uh, You'll recognize the, 
Any, any Trekkie fans in the, on, in the audience? Probably. probably. So you'll, you'll recognize this picture. Uh, the, the, the NASA pilot there is a friend of mine who actually put together a lot of these slides. Manny uh, put a lot of these slides together. But uh, Michelle Nichols got to fly with this uh, before she passed away just last year. Uh, but here's a picture of her when she was on Star Trek. Yeah, she was Lieutenant Uhura, the communications officer. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, she was a communications officer on, uh, on the old Star Trek. And then this is a picture of her in flight. So, yeah, we, we loved carrying. That was one of the things I really enjoyed, was taking the, the you know, the non-scientific people. I, I always thought that was kind of fun to introduce people to what we did, which is why I enjoy doing this. This is uh, not too many people can know about the airplane just because there was only one of them in the world. There's only one Sophia in the whole world, and not a whole lot of people knew about the airplane. So, anyway, that's a little bit about what uh, Sophia does. And I guess I'd like to open it up to questions, if we have any. Yes, sir. Oh, you don't need, you don't need to clap. I just, it's just me. <laughs> yes, sir. Questions? Yes, sir. The question was, uh, who designed the telescope? That was actually a German company. The, when the airplane flew, uh, I don't know if you can look on the side of the airplane. I don't have, the, I have a picture right here. But the airplane was actually operated by NASA. But DLR, which is the German NASA, basically would always fly along with us. So uh, Boeing, it was a Boeing airplane. NASA modified it. Well, actually, actually L3 uh, modified it. But NASA operated it. So we were the operators. But DLR provided the telescope. And so they always flew with it. In fact, I didn't really talk about the telescope too much. But the telescope was just a fascinating piece of equipment. It was a 100-inch Cassegrain Naismith telescope. Again, I could see visible light, but optimized for infrared. The thing, just the mirror alone, it, you would think would be thousands and thousands of pounds. It was like 1,986 pounds. That, that was all. It was just a, extremely well designed. The Germans, you know, they did, did a great job. Now, the whole telescope assembly itself was about 44,000 pounds. In fact, we used to have big steel plates in the front of the airplane on the floor up in the, what would have been the first class cabin. We had huge steel plates on the floor, bolted to the floor, to offset the 44,000 pound big telescope, which was mounted on a spherical air um, bearing to keep it, uh, to keep it uh, pointed at, the, at the, uh, uh, the body that we're observing. Yes, sir. Well, you mentioned briefly about the telescope being stabilized. Uh -huh. And so the, the question was, uh, did, could the telescope always basically see what it was looking at? Yeah, uh, very good question. Um, <clears throat> again, it was mounted on a big spherical air uh, 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 stabilizing mechanism. And the, air the, the telescope itself could see about, about 20 degrees above the horizon to about 60 degrees above the horizon. So it could move 60 degrees, or, uh, from 20 to 60 degrees or so in elevation. But only about one or uh, two or three degrees, I think it was, in azimuth. So when we would fly, the, uh, the, the whole night, basically. You'd, you'd take off, you'd hook up the autopilot, because the, auto, the, the airplane was, uh, at, at, at that altitude, you could, you could hand fly it, and we, we didn't do that very often, because it just wasn't very, an autopilot, unfortunately, could do better than us pilots can. You know, it does a better job. So we had, we had autopilot fly it, but typically, what we would, to point at the, at the celestial body that the, uh, the scientists are trying to observe, they had telescope operators who were typically from Germany, typically, and they would operate the telescope to point it at the body that the scientist is observing, to make sure it's pointed at the, at the, the body. Um, again, the, the, telescope, the telescope itself could move about 40 degrees in azimuth from 20 to 60 degrees out, but then in, in elevation. But azimuth, we had to actually be the, the azimuth. So typically in flight, the mission director, who we were always in touch with in the cockpit, they were down below, we were in the cockpit, and they would say, fly heading of whatever, you know, 295. And that would f be following the flight path for us. But all night long, we were, we were because we were the, we were the azimuth, they'd, they'd, you'd get the command, one left, one left, one left. You heard that all night for 10 hours, basically where you're, you're trying to keep the, the telescope pointed exactly at the celestial body. As, as, as the Earth rotated, as the celestial body rotated, we had to, and as we moved, we had to keep the airplane always pointed at the celestial body. So just about all night, we're making just 
one degree heading changes. One degree. You got to get at the airline. Yeah, I tried to keep it on course as best I could. You know, but at uh, at, at NASA again, the 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 tolerance was just tighter. You know, I have to say, uh, not to not not to talk bad about my my uh, United uh, pilot friends, but I have to say that the experience I had in flying with NASA, they were the guys were just they're exceptional. They're exceptional pilots. Typically, the the full time and I was part time. Uh, the full time uh, NASA pilots, as I understand it, were allowed to fly six airplanes at a time. So they were staying current in six different airplanes very often. They'd fly the 747 one night. And maybe the next day they'd go hop in the F-15 and do some testing. And then maybe the next day they'd hop in the DC-8 and do some testing. And then maybe the King Air. And then maybe the Gulfstream. And maybe the T-34. So, you know, the rest of us have trouble keeping one airplane right side up. These guys, again, were flying six different airplanes. And again, they were very humble people. I, I remember when I got hired, um, I thought, I don't belong in this group of guys, um, but um, uh, and we used to meet at a place called the Bravery up in, uh, in, in Lancaster for safety meetings at the bar, uh, the Bravery. And uh, I, I remember the first time walking in there with, again, all these, these research guys, they're the Neil Armstrongs of the world. That's who these guys are. The, the Neil Armstrongs, the, the, the Gordon Fullertons, the, that's who these people are. And I thought, I, you know, I don't belong in that, in that group of guys. I'm just a pilot. But I remember the first time walking in there and meeting all the guys. See, I'm Craig O'Mara, I'm a new guy, and I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, you said Wayne's World. Anyway, uh, but the thing that I got out from those guys, they said, look, we're just a bunch of pilots get to fly some cool stuff. You know, we're not any better than anybody else, although they were. Um, so they were, they, they, they flew it exceptionally, exceptionally well, but also um, they were very humble about it. They didn't walk around saying, you know, I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread and nobody can do the things that I can do. They'd say, we're just, we're just pilots, get to fly some really neat stuff. You know, back when the other X planes were flying, they'd one day fly the SR-71, then they might hop in a X-15, then they might hop in a whatever the heck. So just exceptional guys. So, but that's, that's the, the telescope operators actually pointed the telescopes at the celestial body that we're trying to look at. And that we did our, our job just was to make sure that the airplane was always in position. We had to hit, again, points at a particular time, particular altitude, uh, to, so the scientists could make their observations. So, yes, sir, in the back. Good question. So the, how fast did we fly and the stabilization, was that affected uh, by the, the, did that affect the handling? It really didn't. Uh, the uh, airplane's on autopilot the whole time. Uh, we very seldom did we kick it off. Once in a while we'd check it, uh, kick it off to check for trim. But typically the autopilot would fly the airplane. Uh, typically we'd fly about Mach 0.82, 8200, uh, 8200, 82 percent of the speed of sound. Uh, tip, you know, 400 and, 460 knots, 470 knots. Um, but again, the, the only issue that was we, the, the, the tolerances between high speed, low speed buffet, uh, stall and, and basically mock buffet, was not very, not very great. Uh, I had some friends that flew the, the ER2, the U2, and the L2s that they'd fly at, they might have, uh, you know, four, five, six knots between low speed and high speed buffet. We'd have 10, 15. Typical airline, when I'd fly at the airline, I, I finished up with a 787, I taught an airplane for years, and 747, I taught an airplane for years. A typical Mach Buffett range might be 40, 50 knots between low speed, high speed Buffett. You didn't worry about it at all. You know, you just, the only problem, the, the 777 was a little bit fast. It would occasionally exceed uh, uh, the, the speed limit because it just, we flew out to get the speed limit in the 777. But the other airplanes was the problem. So. Typically, eight two around there, but we kind of did whatever we needed to do to meet particular times. So we had to adjust that a little bit. So yes, sir. Same question. So the question was because the autopilot could it handle all of the the uh, aerodynamic changes when the door opened and closed, and that's what the test pilots, the flight, the research test pilots had to do when the airplane was built. They had to go test all this. 
Uh, I was a research pilot. In fact, kind of the joke at, 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 uh, at NASA is, you know, you get the, the astronauts, research test pilots, and research pilots. And kind of the joke was, oh, you're just a research pilot? Oh, I'm sorry. You're just, you're just a research pilot? Oh, okay, well. So that was, that was the joke. Then we get a hard time. Well, <laughs> so the question was, did we see anything that was unusual? Um, we would carry uh, SETI, ast SETI uh, a a astronomers all the time. Um, and, you know, the joke was, every time we listened to their science briefing, we would say to the SETI guys, okay, what are you looking for tonight? They said, well, you know, I can't tell you how to kill you, that, that old joke. But, you know, they were looking for signs of life um, out there. Uh, some of the things that we did do, uh, some, I, I kind of kind of proud of some of the things that, uh, that, NASA, uh, that Sophia did, was uh, in, uh, in 2019, in, I think it was April of 2019, uh, we made the, uh, we, we made, uh, we, we observed the, the first helium hydride ion ever, ever, uh, that was ever found in the universe. And I flew several of those missions. Um, helium hydride is one of the first molecules that was formed after the Big Bang. Uh, the, the scientists estimate it, it was uh, formulated about 100,000 years after the Big Bang, which you think, well, that's a long time, but not in the scheme of the universe. So we, we discovered a helium hydride ion uh, in April of 2019, I think. And I can remember, again, flying those missions where the, the, ast the astronomers are saying, we're going to find this. And I remember talking to scientists, going, wait a minute, Doc, you're going to find something that's invisible? out there and you're looking at the universe and thinking there's no way this is going to be done. But they did. Uh, in, in April 2019, uh, they found the first uh, helium hydride ion. Again, it was found up in the, near the uh, constellation Cygnus. And uh, again, one of the earliest molecules ever formed after the Big Bang. So the science that we, that we, just, that we uh, performed was, I, I, I was very impressed by it. But as far as seeing something, when I was a general aviation pilot, another story, I saw what I didn't know what it was, a large sphere followed by, by three small spheres next to it. I was flying 172 many years ago when I was a kid. And out in West Texas, and all of a sudden these spheres, as I'm watching them, I started to call the air traffic control. I said, I got something on the horizon way out in the distance. Do you see anything? Air traffic control says, we don't see anything. And all of a sudden, as we're watching this thing, they just went zip like that, just like they disappeared they moved away so fast, the speed of light plus. And I looked at the, the friend I was flying with, I said, did you see that? And she said, yeah, I saw that, but what was that? I said, I don't know. But, so I had, yes, one time. One time in, in 53 and a half years and 34,000 hours of one time, but nothing on, 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 on Sophia. So, yes, sir? Well, it flew from, first science flight was 2010, last science flight was 2022, 12 years. Um, you know, I just would be guessing off the top of my head, maybe a thousand hours, not sure, uh, maybe a thousand hours. I've never heard a, a, a final figure of how much it, it, uh, it flew. It was, um, in fact, it'd be more than that, because we were flying, we were flying about seven or 800 hours a year times, you know, 12 years. I, I haven't heard, I'd have to actually look that up to see how many hours we put on the airplane. It was designed to fly um, uh, for 20, 20 years, I think, uh, but it only, they, NASA canceled that after 12. The James Webb, James Webb Space Telescope, I'm sure, I'm sure you've all seen pictures that, uh, that it has published. Fantastic pictures, just great. And, and I hate to say that we don't do as good a job, but we don't do as good a job. Uh, so it, uh, James Webb is really why NASA grounded Sophia. That's one of the reasons. I think that's, I think it was designed, I think it was designed originally to do 960 hours a year, I think I've heard, but I think, I, I'm not sure, I haven't seen exact figures, but I, I'm just going to guess seven to 800 hours a year. Because we did have some missions cancel. I, like I said, I only canceled once in several years, but, um, I know there were, I've heard other cancellations. So it didn't fly every night that it was supposed to, which was sad because again, the scientists lost their ability to, to do the observation. So, yes, sir. What did you do over the door? 
when? When did we open the door? So, yes, so the question was, when did we open the door? Yes, typically we would climb for, oh, 25 minutes, something like that, to get to altitude. And then once we got to altitude and stabilized on speed and got to the point that we started the observations, the, uh, the mission director downstairs said, okay, we're, we're stabilized, we're at a particular point in space, particular altitude, then let's open the door. Said, so run a checklist, and we're all listening in on this. And the pilots and co-pilots, we're just flying the airplane. The engineer had a, at his panel had a, a control for the door, and it was matched by a panel down in the mission director. So the upstairs engineer was talking to the downstairs mission director, and we would hear the checklist count, do, you, do the various switch positions, and then we'd hear a three, two, one, open, and then the engineer would actually open the door. Again, I kept listening to see, I kept listening and feeling to see if it's going to hear the vibration. Never did. So the, again, the engineers who designed that were just fantastic. But again, the airplane was out, it was uh, it just exposed to the air. So the, it was exposed to, it had no glass at all. So basically, the, when this door opened in flight, that section of the airplane was completely unpressurized. And all the, the, whatever the outside air temperature was, that's the temperature of then the, the mirror. And the Germans, again, this uh, uh, Kaiser III, whatever the company was, uh, they had taken this all into effect. And uh, um, the, the observations that we made, I don't know of any observations that we made that uh, were distorted, I, not that I'm aware of. I mean, maybe there were. Uh, when the airplane was turbulent, uh, the, the spherical, um, uh, uh, the, the, it was mounted on a spherical uh, a uh, shock absorber, basically, so it would it actually move. You could actually go back in the back in flight, and you could watch the telescope just moving real slightly like this. As we'd hit turbulence, it would just make little slight observations to continue to point at the star. It had to be accurate within 0.2 arc seconds uh, to make the observations. Uh, that's the equivalent of like a, uh, it had to be able to see the thickness of a dime 10 miles away. So very, very accurate pointing capability. One more question. Okay, I'm telling one more question. Is that it? Okay, one more question. Were you asked to apply for the job, or did you see a one ad? How did you, uh, <laughs> well, that's, okay, the question was, was I asked, or was there one ads? Yes, both. In fact, in fact, is anybody interested in flying the ER2 for NASA right now? They're looking for people. Uh, I, was a, I was a United Airlines pilot quick story. I was a United Airlines pilot. I was uh, teaching on the 747-400. I had just had my proficiency check. Every nine months, you got to go back to the dead, uh, training center to get a proficiency check. I'm walking back out of my PC, having barely squeaked by again, as usual. Um, and I see our old 747-100-200 uh, simulator was moving around. I had me walking past it, and it settled down. So obviously, they were finished doing whatever they were doing. So being nosy, I thought, well, I'll go see what this is. And uh, I, I walked down the, the ramp as they brought the ramp down. And I said, hey, guys, what's, uh, you know, we haven't flown the 100, 200 SP for years. What are you guys doing here? So, well, we're, we're NASA, and uh, we fly Sophia. And I said, well, I've never heard of that. What is that? So they started explaining it. And a guy named Ace Beal was the instructor at the time on the, on the airplane. He said, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, we're looking for guys. You fly 747? I said, yeah, I've got 7,000 or 8,000 hours teaching the darn things. He said, good, go apply. So I applied and I uh, got the job. Um, yeah, I, I just wrong, right place, right time. But it, uh, I used to fly for a company called I3. It's Integrated Innovation Incorporated. Uh, in fact, they're looking for people right now. I saw an ad just, uh, they're looking for people. So if you guys fly U2s, anybody, any U2 pilots in here? <laughs> you know, but they need people. Uh, they, they, would, they would hire you, fly the ER2, U2, you fly the, e, the ER2, and you'd probably be checked out in maybe like the Gulfstream 3 or maybe the DC-8. Or the, well, the dc is going away, the 777. So yeah, there's, there's all kinds of jobs, crazy things like this out there. You just kind of keep an eye on, on the pilot hiring websites. And, uh, and I, I saw just this morning that uh, I-3 is still looking for somebody to fly the U-2. So if you're looking for U if you're a U-2 pilot in here, apply. Just go to the website. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I, hope, I hope you got, hope you got a little bit out of it. Uh, Sophia was a, a neat mission, and I, I really was sad to see it go away. And I mean, flying with those guys was the, the highlight of my 
53 and a half years of flying. So a bunch of great people. Thank you very much for coming.